This week, China Tobacco added the vaping industry to its empire. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending December 4th, 2021. From Beijing, China, Reuters reports China brings e-cigarettes under tobacco monopoly law. Yeah, you heard that right. China Tobacco, who controls over 40% of the global tobacco market, just took over the vaping industry in China, who, by the way makes over 90% of the world's vaping products. Up until now, the Chinese vaping industry was in a regulatory gray area. But back in March, Chinese regulators flagged plans to bring the rules governing e-cigs and other new tobacco products into line with those of ordinary cigarettes. From Pan Daily, we find China releases major draft standards for vaping industry. Market concentration is likely. A group of Chinese government bodies on Tuesday afternoon released comprehensive draft standards for vaping and e-cigarettes, sending shockwaves through the domestic industry, which includes leading global firms such as S'more and Relics. In a 26-page document, national authorities made the case for more stringent measures aimed at shoring up product quality and ensuring firms fulfill certain health requirements. According to the World Health Organization, China is home to over 300 million smokers, representing nearly one-third of the global total. So naturally, I downloaded the draft regulations. And since I don't speak Chinese, I had Google translate it. 23 pages of regulations the filter mag pointed out has massive implications for tobacco harm reduction worldwide. Long story short, these regulations are a double-edged sword. Now that electronic cigarettes are firmly regulated by Chinese regulators, their legal status secures the future of vaping. But what kind of future are we going to see? Well, to answer that question, we'll dive right into the regulations. E-cigarette design will meet general safety requirements of household appliances. Lithium batteries and battery packs should meet safety requirements of portable electronic products. Electromagnetic compatibility performance is the same as household appliances. Materials that contact the oral cavity, atomization, and emissions shall meet food safety standards. Materials that don't contact the oral cavity should meet electronic product standards. Hey, this isn't too bad. It's common sense regulations, right? Hold on, not so fast. Nicotine must be at least 99% pure, but it's limited to 20 milligrams per gram and the total amount must not exceed 200 milligrams. That's a 10 milliliter size limit for you mathematically challenged folks out there. Oh, and it gets worse. Section 5.1.1 states clearly e-cigarettes and cartridges that use e-cigarette liquid should have a closed structure to prevent artificial filling, must not leak, and must have a childproof start function and a protection to prevent accidental start. Sorry, folks, I was wrong. I must apologize because, you know, in an earlier news report about China telling the WHO that they're going to comply with FCTC. I jokingly blew it off as China telling the WHO what they wanted to hear and figured they're going to go do what they want anyway. I was wrong. And these regulations prove I was wrong. And China is now following the WHO FCTC and the way that Europe limits things vape related. The regulations go on to specify allowable ingredients, documentation requirements, and allowable additives. Yeah, and this isn't a pretty list either. Furfural is an aldehyde that's toxic above 100 parts per million. Ethanol, and the list goes on. Listen, I'm not a chemist, but I had to stop after seeing the allowable content of furfural at five milligrams per gram, and ethanol, and an allowable ingredient at 100 milligrams per gram concentration, there's 122 
allowable additives to make up the flavor profile of e-liquid, which the regulation state must be made up of glycerin, propylene, glycol, nicotine, and food additives. They even stipulated how companies must test the emissions of their vape products to ensure that these four ingredients fall below allowable limits. Guess the researchers aren't going to be able to falsely claim about these compounds that they found at dangerous levels anymore. Like I said, folks, these regulations are a double-edged sword. On one hand, China just eliminated the open tank vapor market and practically banned synthetic nicotine, which kind of makes sense when you consider how many tobacco farmers China has. According to bluehole.com.china, the State Tobacco Monopoly Administration stated that they will establish a unified national e-cigarette transaction management platform. And this is aimed at maximizing tax collection and ensuring all vape companies comply with the new regulations. Now, before I go any further, this draft regulation is exactly that. It's a draft for comment release. And from the number of articles in Blue Hole, that they've published recently? Believe me, it's caused quite a ruckus in China. After the implementation of the e-cigarette standard, many products on the market will not be available for sale, which leads to something that I've said before. Industry concentration is going to improve the outlook for big vape companies, and the market contracture means that smaller vape companies are going to suffer the exact same fate as the U.S. consumer-driven vape companies. In 2013, the Chinese vaping industry was worth only 550 million yen. But this year is expected to exceed 10 billion yen. There's more than 330,000 companies making products in China, and over 52% of them were established in the last three years. These regulations have literally turned the vape industry into a knockout competition. Which brings us to a plethora of marketing department press releases this week. Vupu announced the overseas launch of the Drag X slash X PNP dash X kit, which is a comprehensive upgrade of the previous Drag X and Drag S. They state the core concept of chivalry was brought to the product design and pays tribute to the glory and the virtue of knights. Man, I love this concept. It blends my love of King Arthur with the Drag X. I don't know how they could have improved the, the coil design that goes into this thing, but it looks fantastic. And with design changes, paying homage to the glory and virtue of knights, this is something that I'm definitely going to be seeking out when it hits the market. Moving on. Geek Vape has secured a product safety liability insurance policy with coverage up to 1 billion yen. The People's Insurance Company of China announced an international warranty service, strategic cooperation with the vape brand Geek Vape. This cooperation agreement includes the whole line of Geek Vape products and its sub brand Geek Bar. Which brings us to Geek Bar launching 10 milligram nicotine versions of its disposable vape bars in the UK. You know, that's always been a pet peeve of mine about disposables. Besides being horrible for the environment, they only offer 20 milligram, 35 milligram, and 50 milligram options. This new product from Geek Vape is going to allow those users to taper down their nicotine usage. And being that these are released in the UK, they're gonna come in pink lemonade, sweet strawberry, mango ice, passion fruit, banana ice, sour apple, watermelon ice, blueberry ice, strawberry ice cream, and grape flavors. Did you notice that there's no tobacco flavor listed? Way to go, Geek Bar. Hey, since we're talking about the UK, Inigan's Why Smoke vaping campaign hits the streets of London this past week. Inigan is proud to create a vaping awareness campaign in the UK. For the first time in two years, the Why Smoke campaign is meant to make us think about our habits, if even just for a moment. The campaign aims to inform smokers that there is an accessible, less harmful option to traditional cigarettes. 
The campaign began November 26th with the mobile billboards traveling through north and central London and continued until the 30th of November. On the 28th, large mobile projections displayed the impactful messages on iconic London buildings, where densely populated, high-traffic foot areas enabled promotional messages to be viewed by the thousands. The campaign also utilized 500 buses throughout London to demonstrate Inneken's mission to create a smoke-free future. Speaking of a smoke-free future, Yorkshire Cancer Research welcomes inclusion of vaping products in guidelines to stop smoking. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence has, for the first time, included vaping products, also known as electronic cigarettes, as a recommended stop smoking aid in its newly released tobacco guidelines. The Yorkshire Cancer Research Team said it is delighted to see vaping included in the guidelines. Dr. Catherine Scott, Chief Executive at Yorkshire Cancer Research, said easy and reliable access to vaping products will give more people in Yorkshire the best chance of quitting for good. The new NICE Tobacco Guidelines means that alongside providing clear and up-to-date information about vaping products, Stop Smoking Services should also make these products accessible to adults who want to use them to quit smoking. The guidelines have been changed because there's convincing evidence to show that vaping products are far less harmful than smoking and are an effective stop smoking aid. The charity's Vaping Demystified documentary explores the truth about vaping and tackles common myths to provide smokers with the information that they need to make an informed decision about using vaping products. I've included a link to their YouTube video in the description below. Go check it out. And while you're there, hit the like button or leave me a comment. And let me know what you think. All right. So we got one more thing from the UK before I give you all the crap from the United States this week. Upstart e-cigarette makers push for NHS licenses ahead of big tobacco. Yep. Vaping isn't the only place where the small guys are fighting for their lives. Upstart e-cigarette makers are vying to get their products prescribed on the NHS as they target a potentially lucrative new market before Big Tobacco commits to the lengthy licensing process. Enjoy considers medical licensing an opportunity to expand into the UK, where they have very little presence now. They only have 3.9% of the U.S. vape market, so it makes perfect sense for them to pursue the UK prescription route into the UK. Nottingham-based Multivape slash DSL Group is also pursuing a license into this multi-million pound opportunity. Meanwhile, Imperial Brands, Japan Tobacco, and Juul have nothing to announce about the topic at this time. British American Tobacco also declined to comment on their intentions. Moving on to New Zealand, where smoking or vaping in cars became illegal last Sunday. The latest move requiring any car, moving or stationary, carrying people under the age of 18 to be smoke-free became law last Sunday in a bid to limit children's exposure to secondhand smoke. Hello! Vaping is not... Smoking. Of all the countries in the world, New Zealand should know better. This is all part of the government's commitment to achieve the smoke-free 2025 goal and follows such useless moves such as plain packaging, retail display bans, and progressive vaping legislation that half-heartedly supports vaping as a quit-smoking tool. I know, I shouldn't be so hard on them. You got these zealots everywhere that dictate how the laws are written and who does what. Well, since we broke the ice, I guess it's time for the U.S.-based bad news of the week. Ultria can no longer sell Icos vape-style devices in the U.S. due to a patent dispute. So let me get this straight. The U.S. FDA has only approved two harm reduction products for sale in the U.S., and now, none of them are available for sale in the United States. Makes total sense. Keep driving the rate of smokers up and up 
and up. Big pharma wins. Big tobacco wins. Tax coffers win. Who cares about smokers' lives, right? Just like in Denver, Colorado, where their city council last week voted 12 to 1 to ban the sale of flavored tobacco products. The ban, which was proposed back in October, was voted on after more than two hours of public hearings and council debate. Speakers were split with approximately two-thirds in opposition and one-third in support of the ban. So what did the city council members debate? They debated whether it was achieved their goal of preventing youth tobacco use. We all know that's not going to prevent any tobacco use by youth. If anything, all it's going to do is drive adults back to combustible tobacco. And it's not going to stop the youth. It's going to encourage them because what's going to be even more readily available now? Combustible tobacco. Right? We covered this last week. Here's another article talking about how young people need flavored vapes to quit smoking. And the flavored vapes do not lead young people to take up smoking. Vaping science is vaping science. Well, except when the science is tainted and obviously draws tainted conclusions. Published by the scandalous New York Post, we find men who vape are twice as likely to have erectile dysfunction. Another tainted study that does not understand the correlation is not causation. Folks, you know me by now. If you talk about a study and you show me and tell me about a study, I'm going to go find it. And I'm going to determine whether it's fact or fiction. And this one is pure fiction. Here's how they did the research. These researchers took data from the population assessment of tobacco and health from 2016 to 2018. Then they looked at the data and they found that 20, almost 21% of these folks said that they had ED. Then they factored in the people that had cardiovascular disease and cut them out of the data. Cardiovascular disease that was probably caused by their smoking habit. Anyway, they removed them from this lot. And they cut the number of people in half. Then they found out how many of these people that were left were vapors. Dual use, daily use, ever looked at a vape? Well, they counted them as a vapor. And then they looked at how many of the ones who were left had ED. And no surprise, after removing the ones that were already sick from smoking, they found twice the same percentage likelihood of ED. But since half of them were dropped, of course you're going to find twice the rate. <sighs> this study never removed those people who smoke. They removed the smokers who already had a heart attack because they already know that if your blood flow is compromised to your heart, it's also going to compromise your Johnson. Actually, it has nothing to do with your Johnson. It only has to do with your circulatory system being able to release nitrosamine. A damaged circulatory system is going to cause ED. So these researchers removed only those people who already had documentation of poor circulation because it was going to skew their numbers. Forget the fact that these vapors were smokers first. Sure, ignore the obvious and make a bogus conclusion based on tainted data. Stanton Glantz would be so proud of these schmucks. Here's some real vaping science published in Public Health. The effects of puffing behavior on particle size distributions and respiratory depositions from pod-style electronic cigarette or vaping products. This study looked at the fourth generation of pod-style e-cigarettes. <coughs> Jewel and study the vapor created using 6.5 and 7.5 watt output to generate 55, 65, and 75 milliliter puffs. Then analyze what happens to the vapor once the user inhales from the device. I'll spare you guys the details, okay? 
but the study showed 52% of the aerosol was exhaled. 40 to 43% of the vape was deposited in the pulmonary tract or in your lungs. And the difference was deposited in your oral or sinus cavity. Of the aerosol that's exhaled, 35 to 52% of it is deposited on the user's head. And the rest of it dissipates into the atmosphere in five seconds. So what did these researchers conclude? Well, since 52% of the aerosol is exhaled, well, they need to study potential secondhand exposure conditions at workplaces, and hence needs assessment in indoor environments. Talk about bias. Being forefront in this research paper, the exhaled aerosol dissipates in five to 10 seconds, but they need to study secondhand exposure. Exposure to what? Who the hell knows? And who the hell gets so close to their coworkers when they vape that they might actually get that 19 milliliters of exhaled five second long lasting vape? You know what? It's no wonder that OSHA couldn't find any detectable levels in the vape shops that they visited. The hyperbole just continues. Texas vape shop owner pleads guilty to unlawful importation of counterfeit vaping products. A Texas vape shop owner pleaded guilty Tuesday to a felony charge relating to the importation of counterfeit vaping products. According to the Department of Justice, Muhammad Azir Khalid, 36, of Garland, Texas, pleaded guilty in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Texas to one count of trafficking in counterfeit goods in violation of 18 U.S.C. 2230-A1. Azir admitted that from October 2017 to November 2019, he intentionally and unlawfully imported counterfeit vaping-related items from China, including counterfeit vaping atomizers, labels, boxes, and bags for vaping-related products. The article continues with CDC, Avali, and how it ended up being vitamin E acetate and THC, but I'll spare you the, the, the horror. Moving on to the Denver Gazette, where the Arizona Attorney General is now touting about reaching a $14.5 million settlement with Juul Labs. And today's settlement holds Juul accountable for its irresponsible marketing efforts that pushed Arizona miners towards nicotine and the addiction that follows. 12 million of this settlement is going to be spent on e-cigarette misinformation, cessation and prevention programs. Two millions going to cover the lawyer fees. So the state's taking that, doing whatever they do with it. Moving on to Politico, where we find the overlooked public health issue that could make or break Biden's new drug regulator. Pharma industry shill Robert Califf, who President Biden nominated this month to lead the FDA, is being looked at by forces from all sides as someone who can reboot the FDA's Center for Tobacco Products. They still haven't made a single tough decision in 10 years, said Greg Connolly, the president of the American Vaping Association which wants the FDA to bless e-cigarettes as an acceptable alternative for smoking adults. With cigarette sales up for the first time in 20 years, over 10% of high schoolers vaping regularly and tobacco-related diseases killing nearly half a million Americans every year, the agency faces a pivotal moment when it could be forced to confront those hard-lined regulatory decisions. Let's see here. 10% of kids have vaped in the past 30 days. That's what she's talking about in this article, okay? 30% of 12th graders and 19% of 10th graders and 8% of 8th graders drank alcohol in the last 30 days. But we're going to focus on vaping. Yeah. Okay. 14% of 12th graders and 9% of 10th graders binge drink. But sure. Let's focus on the single best way to quit smoking. Yeah, okay. There's a link in the description for those of you who want to read this Politico cheerleader advertising for Big Pharma. Because there's a demographic that we haven't talked about on this channel. 
until today. Harm reduction may have a better approach for smokers with HIV than strict smoking cessation, an expansive harm reduction approach for people with HIV who smoke tobacco and are unable or unwilling to quit should be employed, a team of U.S. experts argue in the Lancet HIV. The limited success of smoking cessation strategies in this population brings them to propose this approach. Harm reduction would encompass cutting down on cigarette intake and also reducing the health consequences of smoking through more lung cancer screening and better control of cardiovascular health. We hope this viewpoint will help to begin shifting the idea of tobacco treatment in the setting of comprehensive HIV care from a strictly all-or-none cessation approach, which succeeds only for a small minority of smokers living with HIV, to a harm reduction approach that might extend substantial benefits to both those who are able to quit and the majority who continue smoking, they say. In the U.S. and Europe, tobacco use is now a leading killer of people with HIV. These regions have the highest prevalence of tobacco use among people with HIV. However, in lower and middle income countries, the prevalence of cigarette smoking is also significantly higher among people with HIV than among HIV negative individuals. Let's be honest, folks, okay? Smoking is the leading cause of preventable death. It doesn't matter whether you have HIV or ED or whatever. Worldwide, tobacco use causes more than 7 million deaths per year. If the pattern of smoking all over the globe doesn't change, more than 8 million people a year will die from diseases related directly to the combustion of tobacco by 2030. And tobacco harm reduction works. It works to quit smoking. It works to improve your health. A five-year study by real scientists has proven that smokers who switch to vaping ameliorate objective and subjective COPD outcomes. Here's the definition for those of you that don't know what ameliorate means. Okay? But it means that these people improve their lungs. Their COPD starts to diminish. It gets better. And that the benefits are gained persist long term. We've talked about this study before. There's a link in the description below. Please go check it out if you haven't seen it and didn't know about it till today. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending December 4th, 2021. I sincerely appreciate all of you who watched this to the very end. Don't forget to leave a comment below and let me know what you think. And if you're looking for more news, go check out Jim McDonald's article on Vaping 360. The link's in the description below. The same anti-vaping organizations that forced the PMTA deadline to be moved up, well, they sent another letter to Judge Grimm asking the FDA to regularly report on its PMTA review process. It's a good read, but we simply don't have time to cover it this week. So until next week, be good to each other and keep on vaping. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending November, not November, we're in December. Get this right. Kupina Putz. <laughs>